and rising. So I think we we, we can start. Uh, and if anyone is still yet to come, they can they can join later. So. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Freddie McBride. I'm uh, Director of Digital Communications Policy and Regulation at ENA. Um, and you're all very welcome to uh, this web webinar today on um, ensuring continuity of access to emergency services in the transition to, to IMS voltage services and indeed beyond that as well in terms of 5G and voice over new radio. Um, this webinar follows a session we had um, at the ENA conference last April in Marseille, where we discussed how a lack of voltage interoperability between some networks and some handsets, coupled with the unavailability of uh, 2G and 3G voice services on certain mobile networks, was impacting European roamers to the USA, uh, and indeed potentially to some other countries that we're, we don't have evidence of at the moment, where 2G and 3G services um, are no longer available. Um, for those of you who did attend in Marseille, um, the presentation was made by Rudolf Vanderberg, um, and I'm delighted to welcome him to present at today's webinar also. Um, Rudolf raised this issue over a year ago in a blog post entitled 10 Things to Know About Volte and Voice over Wi-Fi Not Working. Uh, he is a management consultant with over 20 years experience in, in internet, telecom, privacy, online content, standardization, and other peripheral topics. Uh, I met him over 10 years ago uh, at an event while he was working as a telecoms expert for the OECD. Uh, he's now with Stratix Consulting based in the Netherlands. So, so just before I hand over to Rudolf, I would just like to provide you with some housekeeping uh, information on this webinar. So first of all, please mute your microphone when you're not talking. If you have a question, you, can, you have the option to raise your hand. There's also a questions and answers panel um, and there's a chat where you can include your question or even share and exchange views uh, as the discussion continues. The webinar will be recorded and the proceedings, including the, the presentations made today and the recording will be available on the ENA website in due course. Uh, and of course, we will um, provide links to those when they become available. <clears throat> so um, I'll hand over to Rudolf now and he'll present the underlying causes uh, of the problem uh, and provide some expert insights on how it may be resolved. Uh, we'll then have some time for questions. Uh, and after this, uh, Benoit Vivier, Ina's Public Affairs Manager and myself, uh, will provide some information on Ina's advocacy activities to address this issue, um, which we, we did a lot of work on over the summer <clears throat> uh, with the intention to raise awareness of the issue and to mobilize all stakeholders to uh, find a swift resolution. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Rudolf. So Rudolf, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Freddie. It's uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to give this presentation. Though um, I wish I wouldn't have to give it, but well, at least we can work on on fixing this. Um, yeah, it's a weird situation that sometimes we may not be able to dial emergency services in the near future if we don't take action today. And I wish that we can fix that together. Just a short background, you know, as you said, I worked for, in the industry for over 20 years. I generally work in the intersection between technology, business and regulation. So I explain to the tech people why the regulation works this way and explain to the regulators uh, how technology influences the rules and the regulations. Um, I've worked at the OECD, the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs, Tata 2, and Stratix works for similar clients. Why am I calling attention to this? Well, I really like 112 and GSM and the success that they have been. They're excellent examples of how countries cooperating together, in this case, the EU, can deliver massive benefits on a global scale to many people. You know, who would have thought 40 years ago that you could just have a device in your pocket and you can reach a couple of billion people around the world and it works everywhere in a standardized way. And that's what GSM delivered us. And 112 gave the extra bonus that you could just reach emergency services. And really until last year, I never thought that 
that might not be the case for 4G, 5G. I just thought that the world would continue the way I'd grown up to expect it, that it would just work. I had a couple of phones at home um, for my son, a new one, for my daughter, a new one, because she dropped hers. My wife had a new job, so she had a new phone. Some of them did faulty, some of them didn't. And I wondered why. I really thought it was as simple as somebody needs to click on a link or a button and then they activate it for this phone. Or basically who at KPN in the Netherlands do I need to give a bottle of wine to activate this? But it wasn't as simple. Some phones did, others don't. And then I learned through asking questions on LinkedIn and then further, there are many interoperability issues with faulty and some affect emergency calls. And well, since I knew Freddie had moved to the EENA and I knew that what their mission was, I pointed Freddie to it and he was really interested. I wrote a blog and then I, people started emailing me, many technical people, often off the record, and they all faced these issues and they really wanted them fixed, but they didn't know how to raise it or who to get in contact with. And so they figured, well, you are the guy who at least writes about it. So let me tell you. And I want stuff to work. So nobody pays me to do this. Heck, my firm sometimes wonders about the hours, but um, I decided to go after it because it's fixable, but then we need to have awareness. My goal in the end is that we can call an emergency number anywhere in the world with any phone on any network by anyone from anywhere and that they will reach the emergency services and that they get help. But in order to achieve that, we need everybody to work together on a uniform implementation, the emergency calling and test it and test it again and fix it and test it, etc. So as explained um, in April, yeah, of this year, I sent Freddie some messages about, look, in the USA, they shut down 2G and 3G calling, and it's causing issues with Volte roaming. ENA uh, invited me to fly to Marseille basically within a week. I gave the presentation, and as a result, in the Dutch government, there were parliamentary questions and discussions with the government. Um, yeah, people of, of different political parties and of the ministry were all very willing to discuss this. Emergency calls 112 are not a political issue as such. They don't divide people. Everybody just wants this to work. The Dutch government went to a radio equipment expert group. Um, the Dutch government will organize a meeting next week on September 29th with the industry. Um, together with the Dutch government and the ENA, we gave presentations to Senelec on e for e-call, which is affected by this, but also Etsy MTEL, um, just to raise awareness. And we've already had some positive effects. Uh, one operator had issues with emergency calls over IPv4 and IPv6. Um, I heard that from a tech guy who did testing um, and via ENA and their counterparts elsewhere, um, a regulator picked this up, contacted the network and it got fixed. I also heard not, not everybody was happy that it had been noticed because Nobody wants to admit that maybe something didn't work the way it was supposed to, but it's at least good that stuff gets fixed. And that's what this is about, awareness, and then hoping that people get together and start fixing it. So how do interoperability issues in faulty effect emergency calls? 
Well, first let's get back from where we came. We once had GSM, it took years to think up and, and standardize but around 1991, we started building it out and it worked surprisingly well. SIM cards, the whole design of the thing made it possible that you could have multiple phones, multiple providers, competition, roaming, emergency calls were part of the, the GSM directive or at least adopted along the same time that everybody should have the same number in Europe for emergency calls. And well, I don't think anybody didn't have the Nokia 3310. It worked brilliant. Some regulatory issues like roaming fees, but even those got fixed. So basically with that phone, you could travel anywhere in the world or you could buy any phone anywhere in the world from any brand and use it everywhere. at and shut down its 2G, 3G network early this year, and it was a wake-up call. It was the canary in a coal mine. People roaming from Europe to the US started complaining online. I can't get calls. I can't do SMS. I can't make calls, receive calls. They did have data, generally. 4G roaming data generally works, so at least they could fall back to WhatsApp or other types of things, but still, uh, like at the bottom, there's a Swedish guy who says, yeah, but I need two-factor authentication for my work. I get SMSs sent. I can't receive them, so I can't actually access the work systems when I'm in the US. Um, Vodafone Deutschland seem to have had serious issues so much so that they Customers couldn't even really use data anymore. Um, Iliad from France said, well, we were given the option, either all your customers can have 4G data in the US, but then nobody can make calls or receive SMSs, or at the moment we can enable 4G data for all of them, but it will take a couple of months before some of them can get voice and SMS again. So at first they opted for everybody have data because then at least WhatsApp works and all the practical stuff like Google Maps and Waze and whatever you need to travel in a foreign country, Uber at least works. So this is a canary in a coal mine. This is scary because that's not the way it's supposed to work. And 4G voice is supposed to be great, you know, quality of service, super fast, voice and 4G data, and better sound quality. Well, it's 25 years newer, so it should. But there's many issues and the industry is aware of them. This is a presentation that GSMA gave to the ITU. There's lots of issues going from Chipset vendors blocking unknown networks, regional device blocking, lack of interoperability experience in the industry. The scale is too large and the testing too difficult. And one of the first emails I received about this issue once I read the blog was from a guy who said he was a Volti tester and he had to go through 80 tabs on an Excel sheet for about four weeks per phone to do all the necessary testing to see whether faulty would work with the operator he worked for. Every new version basically had to go through the same. I've had this confirmed by people both from handset makers as well as from other networks. It's hard. This is not like GSM where one of the old people who once built the networks, explained to me, well, that's where Etsy got its nickname of European Travel and Sightseeing Institute from. Etsy testing was so standardized and it worked so well that we would go to the meetings and we would just assume everything worked. So it was a good day of work. And then off to the restaurant we went. Uh, not anymore for Volti. 
And there's other issues too. Yeah. Not everybody is ready for Volti. It turns out that 50% of German sims, probably not all the consumers, but still 50% of sims are not Volti ready. That's an issue. Volti support on devices and networks is very unclear. AT&T wanted to explain to its customers what phones they could and couldn't use. Well, short version, iPhones probably work. But those two Samsung sticks you see there, well, if it's a U version, it will work. If it's an F version, it doesn't work. And it will not work. But on the outside, it looks exactly the same. Actually, chips that seem to be the same as well. So what's going on? And consumers are asking that in online forum now. Hey, why doesn't my phone work? So that's a difficulty. One manufacturer in a uh, GSMA meeting gave the following list of issues they have. Basically, it's different everywhere for every network, for every phone, for every chipset. And roaming adds an extra layer of difficulty. So we have something here that isn't tested or standardized well enough that you can just rely on it working. It gets even worse, according to the GSMA, faulty may be blocked by both chipset vendors, handset vendors, but also by networks. In some cases I've heard it's even as bad as if you didn't buy the phone from the operator in a country, they will block faulty on it, despite it being the same model, but you bought it from the wrong uh, shop. Um, it's very difficult. And then comes faulty roaming. Faulty roaming isn't backwards compatible. And it isn't always interoperable either. So there's 717 countries where there's LTE. 232 networks have Volti. But until like the summer holidays, only 50 had faulty roaming. AT&T's move has spurred a couple of networks to um, get faulty roaming, at least with AT&T, but it takes months of testing. Mind you, lots of smaller operators, certainly in developing countries, neither have faulty nor faulty roaming. Currently advising a network in a country where they say, well, it's too difficult and we won't do it for a long while. We're not big enough. And when you have faulty support on a network, it doesn't mean that the device can do faulty roaming. So when you go abroad, it may not work. And then it goes back to the EU's idea of having a uniform emergency call number. Well, that's great, but I'll be sure we can actually roam with the device when we go across a border. Well, in Europe, we often go across a border and we want it to work. This is just some Nokia phones on the uh, free.fr website. Free in France has a good overview of which phones work and how they work or when they expect them to work. Um, and this is the case for many of the manufacturers. Once you have a phone that supports it, the network still needs to implement it. The, in the Netherlands, the Dutch ACM really started pushing operators last year to make emergency calls possible over Volti because most operators just send you back to 2G, 3G, because GSM always works, and don't handle the Volti calls, uh, emergency calls over Volti. Uh, certainly with Wi-Fi calling, which also works sometimes when there's not a mobile network around, uh, that actually hurts 
to reach a PLT of emergency services. So operators now support it. But what I hear from techies in the Dutch operators is that MVROs and inbound roaming. Oh, I see I made a mistake there. So inbound roaming, emergency calls over 40 are still an issue. But also for MVROs in the Netherlands, faulty emergency calls over the three MNOs can be an issue. And it also depends on handsets and it depends on chipsets. And it's difficult. Even standardization issues and implementation issues, for example, with IPv4 and IPv6. So some funds expect the network to do both IPv4 and IPv6, and then the network does only one. Or as we had with one network, it did IPv4 for Volti, normal calls, but IPv6 for emergency calls. It has now changed that to do both again, but the devices weren't ready for a situation where normal calls do IPv4 and emergency calls do IPv6. We even see situations where faulty capable phones are not allowed to use faulty for emergency calls. This is Vodafone Deutschland. Um, it says we don't do faulty for emergency calls and we don't seem to allow it either to the handset bank. I've heard from handset makers that, that this is really literally something they did sometimes need to implement. That should no, of course, be the case, but still. What we need is uniform implementation and testing. We need your unambiguous standards that are supported by all networks, including MPNOs, working in all fonts. It's indifferent to where you buy it or where you use it. It's indifferent to the size of the country or the operator. And this is really an issue for smaller countries in the EU. Um, you can run a serious network, you think, but I've heard from handset makers and networks that the smaller you are, the less units you buy, the less chance that Volti will be activated for your network, the less chance that troubles you have will be fixed. And this all has to do that everything is complex and not uniformly implemented. So what we need is continuous testing. Just like we have for GSM, a standard test where everybody tested against and everybody knew it would work. That's what we need, certainly for faulty emergency calling. And it should be updated. One of the issues that's mentioned too that if, if your phone supports faulty and faulty emergency calling today and something changes, there is no guarantee it will be fixed. My horror scenario for faulty, or also a, a simple guide to how to know if you can call emergency services in the future is you can only use an iPhone can only use the biggest mobile network in your country. You should buy a new phone each year. You should live in a really big country. And you know, um, big countries seem to have to be bigger than the UK. So you should stay at home, don't travel. You should stay with one network, never change. And only use postpaid because what I hear left and right is that there's more issues with Android. There's more issues for small networks and MPNOs. There's more issues when you buy cheaper phones or when you buy them from the wrong ship. There's more issues when you're living in a small country. Traveling and roaming makes it more difficult. And switching networks may mean that whatever work doesn't work anymore. And prepaid users seem to be back of the line. So this is a short description of what we have. Thank you for your interest in this.
I said, what we need is a concerted effort by everybody in the industry. This is not one person's fault. This is about implementation. Sitting in a room, finding out why stuff doesn't work, everybody going back to fix it and then testing whether the fix actually fixes it and testing it again and finding corner cases and again and again. It took a couple of years for GSM, I heard. It could take decades of continuous testing to make sure it remains that way. But that's what we need. And I hope we can all raise awareness and make this possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rudolf, for that uh, presentation there. Um, it's certainly an issue of concern. And I think uh, one comment I would have about this is we have a problem, but when you start to look at the underlying issues, you can see that there are quite, quite a few of them. So when we have an instance of this issue occurring and affecting an end user, we can't say for sure without really some quite detailed analysis to find out what is the issue with that end user not being able to um, being able to make a voice call, let's say. So is it because their handset doesn't have a capable chipset? Is it that their operator doesn't have a Volte roaming agreement with the operator in which they're roaming? Is it to do with IPv4, IPv6 compatibility? Is there a different flavor of Volte implemented? Um, so there's a lot of moving parts in this in terms of how we, when we try to seek to resolve it. Um, and you made a good point about there's the awareness raising element. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about the advocacy work versus the kind of getting the stakeholders together to work through these issues and re resolve them. So we, we just, um, as you were making your presentation, um, there was some questions that came, came in on the chat and uh, I actually provided some responses to the ones I could. So. Um, Yula Barra from the European Commission asked if this is a general interoperability issue that impacts access and emergency communications using voice or SMS. It, it, that, that's correct. It, it's a general issue. So uh, some of the uh, experiences of this issue we've seen. Um, so I, I, I'll give a good example. Actually, I attended the NINA conference in the US in, in June, along with my colleague Benoit. Um, <clears throat> I had an Irish subscription with Vodafone and I roamed onto T-Mobile in the US and I had voice and SMS, no, no issue at all. Uh, and uh, Benoit, we, we had similar handsets, Android handsets. Benoit roamed onto at and uh, I don't know who your operator is in Belgium, Benoit, but uh, you uh, correct me, you, uh, you didn't have a voice or SMS service. That is correct. I couldn't make any voice, no SMS. And uh, my operator in Belgium is Orange. Yeah, so you, you couldn't, it's not just about access to emergency services. You, you couldn't make it, avoid, you can call your hotel or call a taxi. Um, That's right, I couldn't make any call. Yeah, and indeed the sharing. point the point Rudolph raised about two-factor authentication is, is a really, really important one because, uh, you know, sometimes now even if you use your credit card to buy something, you'll get an SMS with a code. Yeah. So, um, the, the, so, so the issue does extend um, beyond emergency communications, but of course, that's a really, really important issue from a public safety perspective. Yeah, maybe I can add something to it. And what really got me going, and you know, I can be a bit direct and um, challenge, uh, confront people on it, but what really got me going on this was the emergency calling issue. Um, if it was just voice, but you can still use WhatsApp or some other things, then maybe I wouldn't have got so riled up. But emergency calls are really, really important and they need to work. That's the moment where you don't want to have to think about whether it works or not. It just should. And I was in the US this summer, um, I have a Pixel 4a phone. Um, in the Netherlands, it doesn't support faulty on KPN. It does seem to work on other networks. 
I tested it in the US. I was able to make emergency calls with my Dutch SIM in it, even without my SIM in it. And I was uh, able to use Vaulty if I put a Google Fi SIM in it, which was my cheapest option for lo uh, local data and calling. But that's also a phone that's well supported in the US and Google did some updates to make sure that emergency calling works over faulty on, on their phones. So I can't see whether that's a uniform experience or not. I have, however, heard many, uh, several examples from people who do faulty testing that even in the US at this moment, some smaller mobile networks in rural areas find that their customers, for example, when roaming in the US on one of the major operators, can't actually make emergency calls to 911. And sometimes that is because of implementation issues in the host network. Sometimes that is because of device issues. And sometimes, Everybody points to each other and nobody really knows where it is because there's a different of, a difference of opinion on how implementation should work. And that's scary because emergency calls should be something that you don't need to think about, shouldn't need to think of that. And at this moment, it takes too many considerations and nobody can guarantee whether it works or not. All right, just just thanks, uh, Rudolph. Just looking through the questions there, we have a question um, in relation to the different LTE bands that are available. Um, do you have a view on the different LTE bands being supported in the in the uh, user equipment? Um, there, is there a potential that um, LTE bands supported in UE hardware versus LTE bands in different regions of the world could affect voltage coverage while roaming, including, of course, for emergency communications. Always a bit. If you don't have a phone that supports a particular frequency, then maybe you, well, then you can't use that one hmm. to reach them one. But that isn't a major issue because there's always a bunch of bands that have been pretty much standardized. Um, it is much more an issue whether faulty works, whether faulty emergency calling works, whether faulty emergency calling and roaming situations works, than whether it's a particular band. All right. Um, there was also a question um, from Jan um, about asking particularly about Switzerland because 5G um, is available there. Um, and it was answered by a couple of our participants that Switzerland uses circuit switch fallback for emergency communications. Of course, that's an important issue in Europe, and it's probably why we're not seeing a bigger manifestation of this problem in yeah. Europe. It's only limited to, to roamers at the moment, we see. Well, uh, but it's um, an... Maybe I didn't really go to the circuit switch fallback. I maybe should have. Um, at this moment, when your phone can't reach emergency services over 4G or 5G, for whatever reason, it often falls back to 2G, as shown, some operators even require it. Um, that masks the issue, because at this moment, many countries still have 2G and 3G networks. But in the coming years, these will be shut down. And then the issues increase locally, but also internationally, because some of the old phones you have may not be updated to do faulty or faulty emergency calling. Other phones, you will only notice it when you go abroad, but it depends on where you are. Circuit switch fallback, well, in the ENA presentation I gave in Marseille, I basically called on regulators not to allow the shutdown of 2G and 3G until this issue is fixed. But 
yeah, at this moment, we just assume 2G and 3G are there and circuits which fall back will save us. But that's not guaranteed for the future. All right, thanks. And um, I, I suppose just given we did mention 5G, uh, we talk about Volte, which is, of course, the voice service on 4G. Um, and on 5G, we call it voice over new radio, um, as you have in the title of the presentation. Um, so, I mean, if we're seeing compatibility issues now with Volte, which has pretty much been around now for since 2012, 2013, I think, in terms of deployments, there might be a couple of earlier deployments, but really we, that's when we started to see it really, really been rolled out um, very widely. Um, and we know that earlier 5G deployments are, are, are very much focused on, on data. Um, are we going to see similar issues now then when we start to, to, to maybe move away from 4G and start to use 5, 5G voice? Yeah, unfortunately, it's much the same platform with different variations. And in some ways, people do hope that some of the early mistakes for, for Volti won't be repeated for voice over new radio. But the underlying issue is still there's not a uniform interpretation of the standards. It's very much dependent upon network, handset, chipset, IMS platform, etc. Country. So people don't know what they need to build against. And as a result, they can't guarantee interoperability. So voice of new radio may even add some extra issues on top. It shouldn't be an issue if we go back to the drawing board and test, cooperate, test, then it's just an extension. But at this moment, it scares me. OK. Uh, thank you, Rudolf. Um, any other questions? Um, if you want to take the floor, you can raise your hand or post them in the chat window. Should I close the screen, maybe? Uh, yes. Um, I see we have a question there from Bjorn um, from Sweden. Uh, I suppose that if we have a problem with receiving SMS, we have a problem with location through AML. Uh, I don't know, Rudolf, you want to answer that, but um, I guess so. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. I hadn't really thought that one too far through, figuring, well, if you can't make an emergency call, that might just mess up that bit too. But um, in principle, there should be a possibility to send an SMS over IP uh, in 4G networks. I kind of assumed but that's probably well assumptions are the um, mother of all problems um so yes this probably needs to be tested too and tested well mm. so that's a good one i hadn't really thought about it but it scares yeah. me again i i, I guess though you, you've got the issue where the device might try and send an AML message, but you're not going to be connected to the PSAP because you can't make the call. So the AML message is not going to be very useful anyway because you won't have or, any, or maybe, any way of getting it. Or maybe the other way around. It might be able to get the SMS out, but no guarantee that you can actually have the call. Yes. Well, yeah. at least then they can find you. But... Yeah. J just on that issue about... Uh, SMS over IMS. Um, I was just uh, recently in discussion with uh, um, some, some some colleagues uh, within the GSMA working groups, and um, they have put a request into 3GPP to start work on a definition of an emergency specification for SMS um, that would cover like your SMS to 112 type service, as well as AML messages, which would be treated and routed in a similar way, and would also resolve this roaming issue that we have with SMS as well. 
um, but we, we're we're getting off topic a little bit with with location at the moment. So um, I see that Matthew has um, put a question in. Uh, I'll just read it out. In the EU, the general regulatory framework applicable to emergency communications already makes mandatory to member states that emergency calls shall work in roaming in the EU, whatever the type of call. Uh, certainly that would be my interpretation of the legislation as well, Matthew. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, uh, Benoit Rudolph. Uh, uh, yes, that's of course true on paper, but that's a bit like the consultation the Commission had last week on new services for, for emergency calls and stuff. It needs to be supported in the handsets as well. Uh, you can make a piece up who is perfectly capable of dealing with all these new technologies and, and new ways of interconnecting. You can even have a network that supports it. But if then the handset just tells you, nope, won't do it, you're stuck. Or if the handset tries to, but is not interoperable with the particular operator, it doesn't work and we don't know how to test it. There's not a one, one truth. So I also saw a question, what if we had one Volti profile, would that fix it? But yes, that's basically where the issue comes from. There are so many options at this moment in Volti that nobody has the same implementation of Volti. And also not everybody has the same interpretation of what those options are and how they should be processed, etc. And so it becomes, so the interoperability is gone. And we basically need to get back to one profile. There's word that the Chinese are working on two profiles at the moment. The GSMA is working on six profiles, I heard. But then there's still the question, do we all mean the same thing with what that profile means? Because if we have 10 different implementations of one profile, that's also in uninterruptible. So we need testing. Fortunately, Etsy is starting some emergency call testing on Volti, I heard. But yeah, that needs to be standardized and not multiple interpretations of it, etc. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, then um, I, I'll move on now to the second part of our uh, presentation today, which is just a uh, just an update on Ina's um, advocacy, advocacy activities in this area. And I do note there's a question there from, uh, from Anne about uh, eCall and from Joachim on, on who should lead in resolving the issue. Um, so I, I might take those questions when, uh, during, during the presentation. Um, and then let me see, there's some more questions come in. Uh, providers of ECS shall support emergency communications under the given available network, closely linked to the firm principle of technology neutrality. Uh, yes, technology neutrality is um, at the core, of course, of, of legislation, um, but the obligation still exists um, for, for those regulated entities to, uh, to provide the service, notwithstanding the technology. Um, and then there's a comment from Andre. As Benoit knows, I travel all over the world constantly. I also have an Android and iPhone from different providers. Let's say that landing at airports is always a voyage of discovery. Turkey is odd as the Android phone works in Istanbul, but the iOS does not. In Ankara, it's the other way around. What I also found to be strange was inconsistent cell broadcast messages in Romania. A few weeks ago, we had bad weather and wild bear warnings, but their delivery was inconsistent between my phones. Yeah, I, I st thank you for sharing those experiences. It's it's very interesting to hear the experiences of people because um, it, it shines some it shines some light, gives some insight into how they may be resolved. Um, and then there's a message uh, on the bright side. I needed to call 112 this summer through TMNL that call was handled via Volte. Um, while we do rely on circuit switch fallback a lot in Europe, we are aware we had some discussion and communication with Ofcom in the UK, and they actually have a public report. Last year, there was over 700,000 emergency calls completed over Volte. So 
Um, it's good to see that it's coming, but there still seems to be some issues, as Rudolf mentioned in the in the Netherlands. Okay, so um, I'll just, if you give me a second, I'll just... Uh, before that, uh, Freddie, if yeah. I may just jump, uh, Jan Janssen did something in his question, which was about AML not working when roaming. That's another issue linked to AML, which is quite hard to implement sometimes when roaming. I invite you to go to our website, ina.org slash webinars, because uh, we organized a webinar on this topic a few months ago, if you want to know more about it. Okay. Thanks, Benoit. And I'll just share this very quickly. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Somebody confirm yes? Okay, great. Yeah, um, so, um, yeah, so, so just to give you a little bit of an update on, on, on what we've been doing over the summer months uh, in terms of raising awareness of this issue and mobilizing stakeholders. So um, there's, there, there's two... Well, first of all, to state that um, uh, while this is a general interoperability issue, um, the fact that it's impacting access to emergency services for, for us is a very, very serious public safety issue. And that's part of our mission to advocate for public safety. So and we see um, two main issues here, uh, and indeed Rudolph alluded to them, you know, uh, in our advocacy, there, there has to be a short term focus, which is based on raising awareness. Um, it's important that end users are aware that they could be affected by the issue so that they can prepare accordingly. And indeed, Rudolph in his presentation showed some screenshots from various operator websites informing end users of the issues. Um, it could be, you can see there, I, I just have a screenshot on this slide about when you go to manually select a network. Um, this is from Belgium. You can see that all the operators in Belgium have still available to 2G, 3G and 4G networks. Um, so it could be um, if you're in a country and this issue happens to you, you could manually select and connect to another um, operator's 2G or 3G network. Um, of course, that would be on the basis that your, your service provider in your home country has, has a roaming agreement with that operator. So the awareness is really, really important in the short term. Um, the longer term focus is, is that we really need lots of different entities here to work together. Um, there are a number of issues that are causing this problem. Um, there are compatibility and interoperability issues with hardware. There's different uh, flavors of Volte. There's potential for IPv4, IPv6 compatibility issues. There may be a lack of Volte roaming agreements, a whole list of issues. And some of those, particularly those that involve hardware, um, are not going to get resolved overnight. And so it's really, really important now to start the discussions and, and to continue those discussions with all of the stakeholders to, uh, to try and get, um, you know, an acceptable resolution to this this issue going forward. Um, as also, as we've seen in some of the questions, at the moment, this issue is mainly affecting roamers outside of Europe. Um, and, you know, I, we discussed briefly as well, the role that circuit switch fallback plays in Europe at the moment. Um, and it's providing a safety net for emergency communications, if you want to call it that. Um, but as we do start to see 2G, 3G sunset in Europe, this issue, if we don't resolve this issue, it will start to become a problem. And the level of roaming we have across borders in Europe would make it a very, very serious issue. I mean, we have people who live in one country and work in another and travel across borders each day. So, um, but I do think we have time because uh, as we all know, there are certain applications out there in Europe, uh, e-call, for example, smart metering, where uh, and indeed, we have information from some operators that their plans for 2G and or 3G switch off um, could go out as far as, you know, 2030 and beyond. Um, so not an absolute hugely impactful issue right now, but we have to resolve it because um, over time it will it will become a problem. So um, during the summer months, um, uh, Benoit and I got together and we uh, we, we, we talked about who, who we should be trying to contact about this issue. And indeed, there was a question from Joachim in, in, in the chat about who should lead on it. Um, I'm not entirely sure who should lead on it because uh, there are so many different players involved here. And I think everybody has a role to play. Um, 
from a European perspective, we should remember that there are laws in place for this. Um, and uh, there, to, to my mind, there's no regulatory gaps there in terms of what the obligations are. Um, and as someone pointed out, they are technology neutral. So it's no excuse to say that you can't provide access to emergency services just because it's 4G um, and it works in 3G. So uh, I think that the fact that the obligations exist should be enough of a motivation and a driver for all, all of the stakeholders to, to, to mobilize and resolve it. So uh, in that context, we wrote to, um, to 31 uh, national regulatory authorities with responsibility for electronic communications. Um, we wrote to Etsy. We wrote to Thierry Brett Breton, the responsible European commissioner, the Federal Communications Commission in the US, because that's where we're seeing a lot of issues with roamers. Industry representative bodies like the GSMA, MVNO Europe, Digital Europe, Etno, ECTA, uh, and the Umbrella Consumer Organization in Europe, which, which is, represents, I think, over 40 consumer representative bodies in Europe, um, uh, to, to put it on their agendas um, for, for attention. Um, we also submitted a response to the Beric consultation of the retail roaming guidelines. And uh, uh, it was quite specific because the, the retail roaming guidelines uh, uh, consultation that Beric had uh, in the document, uh, the draft guidelines, they had um, a section on machine-to-machine uh, -machine or cellular-based IoT um, type applications. And while uh, it just got us thinking on that from an emergency communications context that E-call, although not, not specifically an M2M application, it's deployed like one. Um, and you've got literally a device in a, in, in a vehicle that can make an emergency call. Um, and one of the things that Beric highlighted was that these types of applications tend to, to roam on a permanent basis. Um, so it's really important that um, if, if in the future we start to, and we know that there's a uh, there's a, uh, an amendment to, to, to the e-call framework coming that will ensure that it works in, in, in more recent uh, technologies, so 4G and 5G. So you'd be talking about Volta and Voice Over New Radio, that, um, uh, that it will work. And the thing about it is, if a device doesn't work, you can, you can always change that device. But if that device is embedded somewhere, it's logistically infeasible to, to try and take it out. So testing will become a really, really important thing because certainly before those IVSs are deployed, we really need to know that they will work. Um, so uh, a lot we've we, we've written, we've had follow-up meetings with a lot of these organizations. And, and I have to say that the engagement from all stakeholders has been very positive to date. Um, we've already had formal replies from many. Um, we have we've had follow-up meetings and we have we have others scheduled. Um, on the standardization side, um, there was a, an analysis of the relevant standards done. Um, no fundamental problems with standards were reported, but some minor updates um, may be necessary. Uh, and I think that points to the issue that we, we might be looking at more of an incorrect interpretation or implementation of the standard than uh, actually a problem with the standard itself. Um, but if we do have like 50 different flavors of Volta being implemented around the world, that's always going to cause an issue. So maybe some consolidation in that respect would be useful. Um, the regulators that we have been in, in touch with are engaging with their stakeholders at the national level. So that's really, really important. Um, the GSMA, Ethno, and MVNO Europe, which are really important industry representative bodies, are, are working closely with their members to understand the issues. Uh, and, and to plan uh, solutions. Um, the industry representative body, uh, sorry, the consumer representative body, BEOC, has raised it with uh, the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, which is um, a, a forum, if you like, for consumer representative bodies on both sides of the Atlantic. And given the impact that we're seeing uh, uh, on European roamers heading to the United States, I think this is really important development. Uh, we don't have an update yet on, on, on how those discussions are going. Similarly, our uh, cooperation with the National Emergency Number Association in the United States, NINA, they've raised the issue with um, an organization or a working group called the Communication Security, Reliability and Interoperability Council, which is essentially an advisory council to the US government, including the FCC on regulatory issues. 
um, and we hope that the impact on European roamers can be brought up in that forum. We've done press releases, media articles. Um, we authored an article ourselves in the Crisis Response Journal, um, which was recently published. Um, and we have, we'll be constantly monitoring this issue over the next few months. And we already have in our draft program for the next ENA conference, which will take place in Ljubljana in April next year, um, we're working on building um, a session uh, solely focused on, on this topic. Um, and hopefully by that stage, we'll have some better news to, to report on progress and resolving the issue. Um, there's just one thing I skipped over there, and that was um, a point that Rudolf mentioned. Um, another really important development is that Etsy has, has uh, 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 set up this testing task force. Um, it had a call for experts. Those experts have been um, contacted and accepted, um, and it will develop network interoperability test descriptions for emergency services over voice over LTE and uh, its timeline for that work will be from September. So it started this month uh, and it'll run until January, 2024. Um, so we see that as a very positive step as well, given, given the issue with um, interpretation or incorrect implementation of standards. Uh, Benoit, am I missing anything at this stage? Uh, no, I think it's, it's quite, uh, quite complete. Okay. Uh, just to mention, we've submitted also a complaint on the website of the the FCC in the United States um, on my behalf, as I was unable to make any call when I visited the US in June. Uh, and the, the FCC is looking into the matter as well in the US. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I forgot to mention that. Um, so you know, we're 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 trying to to do what we can to to mobilize stakeholders. Um, it's a really important issue. Um, all of you in this call are, you're either end users that could be affected by it or, or you represent stakeholders um, uh, uh, that could be affected by this issue or could have some input or influence on resolving it. So we would encourage all of you to engage um, and uh, try and get a, a solution uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, so that brings us to the end, and uh, uh, we have maybe one minute, one or two minutes for questions. Um, let me just yeah. go. Freddy, so during your presentation, there were a lot of uh, interesting discussions on the on the chats about the uh, what can we do actually to uh, to address this, and it's not an easy issue. I also uh, saw a few questions on the Q and A box, uh, which I am going to uh, read that. Perhaps to you, perhaps, perhaps to Rudolf. Um, so we have Gaurav Shohan who has two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, will the emergency call uh, be made mandatory to be completed over the um, forbidden public land mobile network Volte? And the second one is also quite technical, is what about the location uh, where home public land mobile network 4G network is not available? Only the forbidden public land mobile network 4G uh, radio access te um, technology are visible to the DUT. And I'm not sure what DUT stands for. If you haven't understood, perhaps we can ask Gorab if you still want to raise your hand and then so that we can give you the possibility to explain your question better. It's device under test. So if I'm not mistaken, um, he asks, um, what if the home network isn't available, but there's another network available, can you still make emergency calls? If I understood correctly, then, oh, no, I, I actually know. Uh, yes, 4G emergency calls or faulty emergency calls are supposed to work on any network and if so required in countries, even without a functioning SIM card, um, it at least did so for my Pixel 4a on AT&T in the USA when I tried. So that's good. Um, but in some situations, it may not work. And that might then be due to implementation issues that should be fixed because with GSM it worked. And we basically want the same functionality back. I hope I 
I have that correctly. Um, um, Gaurav, I saw you uh, lowered your hands. I hope it's answered your question. Uh, otherwise, please clarify, uh, put some other comments in the chat, maybe. Okay, uh, I saw you got your answer. Is there any other question? I'm going through the chats. I think there had been some discussions around the role of everybody and some understandings about the legislation. I do not see, see anything else. I see a question from Thomas uh, Reschke about, uh, would it be possible to share the results of your analysis of the IMS standards? Um, well, the analysis was uh, done by Etsy, and I should say, I should clarify, it was a preliminary analysis by Etsy staff. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if we can share it, um, but I, I'll find out. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions um, or comments, um, and it is... Well. Uh, maybe short one. But yeah, there were some ahead, people Rudolph. asking like, who should take the lead, mm. and answered in the chat. But um, you did, yeah. In principle, of course, it would be excellent if the industry would take the lead. What I hear from people in the industry is that the current situation with faulty and the interoperability issues between devices and networks and handsets is costing everybody lots of money. So the way one manager of, an, of a telco told me, only after I gave a presentation, they realized how bad the situation was. He said, I always thought the younger generation was complaining about 4G voice because I did 2G voice and stuff. And I figured, oh, well, how hard can it be? These kids don't, you know, these kids these days complaining. And now he realized how, how difficult it was. But it's hard to get everybody working towards the same goal it does help i think if a regulator puts down some ground rules a bit blunt might be the radio equipment directive if you don't comply with certain tests you can't sell it in europe that gets some people aligned maybe if you can't shut down a 2g network because the regulator tells you well you're not in compliance with your license or the law that might get some people moving um, yeah, this needs to be concerted effort of the industry, and it will help them too because nobody wants a customer, whether it's a telco or an end user, tell them, "Well, it doesn't work here," and then have spent months figuring out where the bug is. Yeah, you're right, Rudolph. And, uh, and as uh, I was just uh, going through the chat and I saw a comment from uh, Frank Mass from the Netherlands saying that, that there is actually quite an urgency because in, in Europe, uh, um, we are starting, well, we will be starting the, the complete shutdown of 2G, 3G in the, in the next year. So um, I agree, there is some kind of urgency. And, and from my personal example, it's it's a very bad feeling that like to know that in case you have a problem, you're not able to call the emergency services is, is something that you don't feel safe actually when, when that happens to you. So it's not, it's not a, a nice situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, if that's everything then, um, I would like to thank you all for your attention today. Um, it's been very useful to have the discussion. Please get in contact with us um, if there's any any insights that you have on this issue and how it might be resolved. We'd be very happy to hear it, and we'll we'll take it up and run with it if it's something we can do. Um, I'd like to thank Rudolph for his presentation today. Um, I should, as he said himself, we're not paying him to do it. Um, this is an issue that affects end users, and indeed, 
it, it affects every one of you as well as a European citizen. So um, the sooner we have a response, the better. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to close the webinar. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, and I hope you have a nice afternoon um, or a nice evening, depending where you are in the world. All right. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye now.